Welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you all again. So for today, I thought we would continue with um, the discussion of how to design experiments. And um, hopefully we, we finish this chapter from our uh, course today and we move on to other things starting next week. Uh, I fell down this rabbit hole. I was sort of looking for interesting readings to add to the lecture and the class. I came across a bunch of new books that I didn't know of before. Uh, and I found all kinds of interesting things in there. So I'm recommending them to you as well. Remember, this class assumes that you're doing a lot of reading on your own outside of class. Uh, there's only so much I can cover in lecture. And also, um, like you can read about a lot of this stuff uh, on your own. I'm so trying to uh, extract some pieces uh, that I find most interesting and maybe worth discussing as a group. Um, but certainly, I can't cover everything. So I just just to remind you, I do hope that you find some time outside of class, especially uh, since there uh, you have so much time from homework because I haven't uh, been flooding you with homework. Uh, hopefully, you find some time to read some of the stuff um, that I'm recommending because I think it's really worth reading and I think it adds a lot to what I can do in, in lecture. So here are some things that I would recommend you to read. You will find all of these, hopefully, if you, if you don't ping me, um, you'll find all of them in our shared Google Drive folder with readings. I, I tried to extract all the relevant chapters from all of these and, and post everything in that folder. So hopefully you should find everything there. Uh, if not, just let me know and I'll, I'll post it. Um, so turns out, I mean, I, I knew this, but I, uh, this was just confirmation. Uh, folks over in hum human and computer interaction have, I think, a much more developed literature on research methods compared to software engineering. Uh, so, you know, there's amazing textbooks uh, in human and computer interaction that talk about research methods and uh, designing experiments and data analysis and statistics and all these things that we care about in this class as well. Uh, and so here's three that I found that I'm recommending. One is the McKenzie book. So I, um, chapter six there in particular is especially relevant for today's lecture. And I guess the uh, discussion we've been having for the last two or three lectures, um, the one on hypothesis testing. Then this book here that you see behind me, this is really awesome. I, I love this. Um, there's a couple of really good chapters in there. One on designing experiments. So we're gonna uh, cover a little bit of that together uh, and, and one on so statistical analysis, what you do with this data that you're collecting through an experiment. Uh, so I, I recommend that as well. Uh, and finally, there's this modern statistical methods for HCI book that I just discovered that has all kinds of very uh, readable, digestible uh, material about uh, how to do statistics on the kind of data that you'd be collecting through experiments in a rigorous way and how to not fall uh, trapped to some of these statistical, uh, common statistical pitfalls. Uh, so you'll, you'll see a few chapters there that I, that I recommend. And hopefully you find all of these in that shared folder. And, and please, please read these. Uh, they're really, really cool. Um, on top, you see a couple of references from software engineering. So those of you that are particularly interested in the software engineering perspective on empirical research, you could take a look at, at those. Um, there's not much, honestly, there's not much difference in uh, the kinds of research questions and so on that people ask in the human computer interaction literature compared to the software engineering literature, uh, at least as far as I could tell. Um, but you'll find so two books coming from the software engineering community uh, and just a few chapters in there that I recommend are especially relevant for this lot, series of lectures we've been having around experiments and, and measurement and so data uh, tricks and so on. Uh, so. Uh, I, yeah, you, you'll find those there as well. Uh, and I, I mentioned this before last time, the sort of textbook on designing experiments, if you will, the classical textbook is the Shadish Cook and Campbell book. So that's the thing on the, on the left there. Okay, how, any thoughts or questions or anything on, on any of these before I talk about something else? I don't remember this odd glow behind me. I remember I used to blend much more smoothly into the background. I have no idea what happened. I didn't change anything. Maybe it's the lighting. Uh, 
it's very annoying. Uh, so I'm sorry about this. I don't want to spend time hacking or playing with it now. I'll just tolerate my glow. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about you know, experiments. I'm going to start with um, a piece on the vocabulary vocabulary of experiments. So some some terminology and some kinds of experiments that you'll encounter in your in your own work or in the literature or in the popular media as you're reading about this. So the um, when you hear somebody mentioning the term experiment, that typically refers to a study in which some intervention is deliberately introduced to observe its effects. Actually, there's a lot of confusion around this. Uh, so you will see, um, so this is the Shadich Cook and Campbell book. You'll see how, so this is the definition of experiment they propose. The much more, I think, common and accepted definition of experiment is the one that involves random assignment of participants to conditions. Which isn't implied uh, in this uh, in this definition here. Okay, so they sort of distinguish between experiment and randomized experiment. I think uh, they're one of the few sources that that does this. Uh, so randomized experiment, we, we talked about this: a kind of experiment where you um, assign uh, participants to receive a treatment or some alternative condition through a random process. Uh, in my experience, these two things are one and the same. I, the, the literature that I'm used to does not distinguish between these. Uh, when people uh, say they're doing experiments, they sort of refer to randomized experiments as opposed to um, other kinds. Uh, okay, so this one's important, a quasi-experiment. So this is a term you'll encounter a lot. Uh, quasi-experiment, yeah, so quasi means almost, almost experiment kind of experiment, right? Not quite experiment. A quasi-experiment is an experiment in which units are not assigned to conditions randomly. Okay, so you still have different groups of participants and uh, they've been applied uh, treatments and whatnot, the, the different conditions, but they've not been assigned randomly. So if you remember the papers we talked about last time, for example, the formal method study, remember that? the teaching formal methods to undergrad students at some university. That one was a quasi-experiment because the researchers had not randomly assigned the students to either the formal methods condition or not, right? They, had, they still had these different groups that they were observing separately, but they had not randomly assigned participants to the groups. And we talked about a lot of threats to validity that um, may have happened because of that. Um, okay, this one's also very interesting and also very common, a natural experiment, another term you'll encounter a lot. So here in a natural experiment, we're talking about experiments where the cause uh, isn't typically something that the researchers manipulate. You could think of it as something that has occurred naturally. Think of it as a natural disaster or, or things like this. And actually you'll find, I'll come back to this in a second, you'll find a lot of these examples in popular media uh, of natural experiments. Like we're, we've been living in one for the last 12 months or so. And that's, you could think of that as a natural experiment um, because it allows, so it's some intervention that has happened outside of the control of the researchers, but um, it's either that some people have been exposed and others have not, so, or they've been exposed at different times. So you can so study their, um, how they've, uh, they've been impacted by this uh, differently. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what else I was gonna say. Uh, I forgot the last uh, second half of my sentence there. So it's, it's about a um, intervention that has occurred naturally and typically it's associated with natural disasters uh, or the pandemic, for example, um, but it, it needn't be, it also can be, um, anything that is outside of the control of the researchers that's still considered a natural experiment. But for example, um, a lot of the research that we do in my group, if you will, can be considered natural quasi experiments. So it's natural in the sense that we're studying, for example, the adoption or usage of a certain tool or a certain practice across these communities of open source software developers. That's the intervention. Right, so some 
projects, some communities have adopted this tool, this practice, others have not. You could think of the, the tool or the practice as the intervention, and you could study how that has changed things in those communities or, or projects, okay? Um, and it's a natural intervention in the sense that it's not something that we, the researchers, manipulate. We're not the ones introducing this tool or whatever to those open source projects and studying the effect of that, right? It's just something that has happened naturally in the data that we're looking at. And it's a quasi experiment because we're not actually randomly assigning, I don't know, projects to tools or tools to projects, right? We're just observing um, projects that have um, taken up these tools and practices naturally. Uh, and we can compile groups to compare, you know, for example, a group of projects that have adopted a certain practice with a group of projects that have not. And, you know, maybe we want to make inferences about how much more uh, effective or productive or, or what have you uh, one of the groups was compared to the other, right? But we're not the ones doing the assignment. It's just something that has happened naturally. Okay. And, and finally, the last thing you'll encounter is correlational studies or observational studies. Um, this is where um, we are um, observing relationships, measuring relationships, analyzing uh, relationships between variables um, that um, to, without, I guess, recruiting participants specifically for this purpose. Um, so again, back to the example I gave you, um, most of the studies that we do in my group can be considered observational studies or correlational studies because we're looking at this historical trace data from these open source communities and whatnot, um, as opposed to actively recruiting participants from these open source communities to participate in these studies, right? A lot of the sort of repository mining style research that, um, that I do in my group can be considered uh, correlational studies or observational studies. Okay, so this, this is sort of the terminology that you'll encounter a lot. Uh, and so it's good to know and understand what the difference between these things uh, is. Any thoughts on this? Okay. Could you, um, oh, sorry. Could you speak more to the difference between like natural experiments and observational studies? I, th I think, um, so I, is, um, are natural experiments just like a special case of a correlational study where like you're doing this correlation um, analysis, but uh, there is some like event that happened. One interpret, uh, thanks for this. And I agree this was confusing. One interpretation I have of this, uh, and I, I could very well be wrong, which is why uh, as always, you should refer to the books I'm, I'm trying to uh, convince you to read instead of um, only my lectures. But one interpretation I have of this is that when people think of natural experiments in, in, in the sense here, um, they typically think of um, so looking forward uh, in time uh, in, in the same way that you would, uh, you would with a real experiment, with a true experiment. So you, you, let's say you decide to start a research study right now and you're sort of looking forward at, in, in time and uh, collecting data and whatnot from say participants exposed or, or, or uh, impacted by the pandemic versus uh, people not impacted by the pandemic or something like this, or the earthquake, you know, maybe there's different cities or whatever with different uh, policies, you, I don't know, like um, minimum wage policies, things like this, if you wanna compare, um, compare those, the effect of those, policy changes. But I think, I think it's about sort of looking forward uh, from the beginning of the uh, research project. Whereas I think with these observational studies, um, 
well, I agree. So that fits the pattern there too. But I think more commonly, you're sort of looking backwards at, at things. So I think whenever you're sort of digging up data from the past um, that has already happened and is, is sitting somewhere, uh, whenever you're doing that, I think that's sort of more commonly referred to as an observational study. Uh, and I think, you know, even if you were to do that for, say, uh, I don't know, an earthquake or minimum wage policy or the pandemic or something, um, whereas if you're kind of doing it now and sort of looking forward and collecting it, uh, I think that's more commonly referred to as a natural experiment. It, the other... Um, the other interpretation I have of this is that with natural experiments, the kinds of interventions that are considered natural interventions are of a slightly different magnitude than, than the ones we're typically looking at in these observational studies. Right? So you know, earthquakes and natural disasters and things like that, sort of a, a bigger scale thing. Um, but I don't know if that necessarily makes a difference. Thank you. Hopefully, the book is clear on this, and you know, if you get a chance to um, to read that, let us know next time. Uh, Bogdan. Yep. So, would you say that correlational study is that close to what a retrospective looks like, or are, do you consider them different things? I, I don't know the term. I don't know what that refers to. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I know the English term retrospective, but I don't know the technical term. I see. Yeah, I guess this question was from the previous or the paper on the single double blind study because they they said they were looking at retrospectives, um, which I guess seems similar to what a correlational study is, um, in which they kind of like looked at the previous data, or they like went back and looked at previous data um, of other instances of I guess single and double blind conferences, but um, yeah, I'm not too sure if. Um, I'm not too sure if they defined what the, the retrospective was there. Um, that makes sense to me. Um, so, so not the main experiment they did themselves in, that year at the conference with you know, randomly assigning reviewers to papers, not that part, but the part where they're looking at uh, what others have found and did some meta-analysis of that, right? That's the one you're referring to? Uh, yes. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think, um, so I, I don't remember the paper exactly right now, but I think that fits this um, definition of an observational study or a correlational study. So I, I guess the main difference here is so think of anything experiment where there's some manipulation typically versus anything correlational where there isn't some manipulation. So you're sort of retrospectively observing historical data, trace data is another term used for this historical data, trace data, um, observational studies. So I think, I, I don't know if there's necessarily a technical difference between these terms. They may, they may, there may well be, I just, I to think of them as more or less one and the same thing. And yeah, I think what you're describing as retrospective sort of fits this mold of a correlational study. Sounds good. Okay, thanks for these. So yeah, we talked about sort of randomized experiments. This is what you um, uh, should consider as true experiments and what people often consider as true experiments in the literature. Um, this is why I, I sort of find this use of the term experiment from the Shadish Cook and Campbell book a little bit confusing because I, you know whenever I think of experiments, I think of true experiments and or anything else is either a quasi experiment or a natural experiment or something else, but it's not an experiment. But to, to me, I'm a little confused myself. Like I, I don't know um, how you can have an experiment that is not a true experiment and also not one of the other ones like a natural experiment or a quasi experiment. Like I don't, I don't know what else there is that is neither a true experiment nor a quasi experiment nor a uh, natural experiment. Um, so that's that's why I'm confused about this. Okay, so this is the stuff we've been talking about before. Uh, you randomly assign participants to uh, conditions, and you get at least two different groups of participants, and 
through this magic of random assignment. And if you have large enough samples, you expect these to be statistically indistinguishable from each other on average on uh, whatever other dimensions might confound uh, your analysis, right? This works if you have enough people, right? It doesn't work if you have three people in every group uh, because you know it's just not gonna be enough size there to you know, average out all of these individual differences. But if you have enough people in these groups, you know, on average, you'll have just as many, I don't know, tall people and short people and um, I don't know, uh, whatever other attributes may matter to your analysis, right? Uh, right, so because of this magic of random assignment, the outcome differences, if any, are likely due to the treatment. So this is the gold standard for, uh, for science. Um, right, this is another way to look at this. So it, when you are designing a study, do you have multiple groups um, or conditions or not? If you do not have multiple groups that you're looking to compare, you're definitely not doing an experiment. Okay? If you have multiple groups to compare, um, you know, are you randomly assigning them or not is the, the other branching point here. Right? If you're randomly assigning uh, your participants, your units to conditions, then you're doing a true experiment. I call that an experiment. Uh, if not, then you're doing anything but. You're doing a quasi-experiment or something else. Okay, so this is a simplified version of the previous thing uh, from one of the HCI books. Okay. Uh, this coincides more with, aligns better with my own perception of how people use these terms in, in computer science. Uh, okay, let's talk about a few specific designs that involve random assignment, which is ideal, right? So, you know, ideally you, uh, if you could, you would do this because of, um, all the reasons we talked about before, uh, it's a stronger design if you can randomly assign participants to conditions. So um, I'm gonna introduce some notation here when describing these. This is again from the Shady Cook and Campbell book. So here um, we, so there's two rows. Um, that means we have two conditions. Um, the R letter there says that the uh, participants have been randomly assigned to either one of the conditions, okay? Um, the X is the treatment or the intervention. So you can see that the first group of participants was treated and the second group was not in this notation. Um, and the O is just the observation uh, of whatever uh, measures you're studying uh, done post-test after you um, administer the treatment, the intervention. Okay, so this is sort of the, uh, way a diagram a way to represent this randomized um, experiment that we just talked about okay. so the um, uh, a limitation with this particular design right the, the most basic design you could think of right two groups of participants one group gets treated the other one does not uh, and then you observe differences in outcomes the major limitation of this design is that you can't separate the um, um, fact that you're being treated from whatever active ingredients there might be in the treatment itself. Okay, so um, take the vaccine as an example. With, with a design like this, if, say, if people in the vaccine group get better, in the treatment group get better, you don't know if it's because of whatever you put in the vaccine itself, or if it's just because you poke them with a needle, okay? So may maybe it doesn't matter what you put in the vaccine itself. Maybe the uh, cause here is being poked with a needle, right? And that's what's causing people to get better. So with, with a design like this, you cannot know that. Right, do you see that? So what do people do? Use a placebo. Right, so a way to fix this is, for example, there's two ways to fix this. For example, you could, um, in, in the control group, instead of having no treatment, 
you could administer whatever the gold standard uh, or state of the art treatment might be. Or say you're building a new tool and you're looking to evaluate it through a uh, human study, um, you know, you could compare uh, whatever uh, uh, people do with your tool to whatever people do with some competing tool, right? Uh, that's considered to be, I don't know, the state of the art, the gold standard for whatever problem you're studying, right? As opposed to uh, comparing the people using your tool to people using nothing at all, okay? Um, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, another way of doing it even better still is if you um, add an additional control group that is not treated at all. So um, the, in the first design, the one in the middle there, that you see there, the one with two treatments, um, the one limitation of that design is that if there's no effect, like if say, you know, uh, XA, your tool is the one you were hoping to show an effect for, if there's no effect that, I don't know, people aren't any more productive or don't uh, make any fewer mistakes when they're writing code or whatever it is you're studying, um, when using your tool compared to when using the uh, state-of-the-art tool, um, if that's the case, if there's no effect, then you don't know if um, it's because both tools, both treatments were equally effective or equally ineffective. Does that make sense? So this is why having this third group still that is a pure non-treated control group helps distinguish that. So do you remember, I think it was a couple of lectures ago, do you remember this um, study of um, what the effectiveness of wellness programs? I think that was a good example of, of this where they, um, so they had so three three groups uh, being studied. Uh, people that were offered a chance to participate in the wellness program and took it. People that were offered a chance to participate in wellness programs but did not take it. And people who were not offered a chance at all to begin with. Okay, so this is one reason why, uh, why that was a good design. Um, okay, either one of these though has still one limitation that is pretty important. There's no pretest. You're not testing uh, with these designs as described. You're not testing anything about your participants before the experiment itself. Okay, so um, this can be a problem if there's a high risk of attrition, um, meaning people dropping out mid-experiment or something like this. This is especially the case with some more medical style research, but also for, you know, for example, for um, computer science style experiments, um, Frank can tell you, we did the study recently trying to evaluate the NL2 code tool that he had built. Um, he could tell you about how some of the participants started doing the tasks and I don't know, maybe they didn't find it interesting or got bored or whatever reason. And then just, they just dropped out before completing everything we had assigned them. So that's attrition. Um, and that's potentially a problem. It's not necessarily a problem, but could be a problem if the people dropping out are somehow very different from the people that stay, right? Um, so, um, this is why it's, it's good to be able to test participants also before the experiment on some of these measures that are relevant. Um, so now you could ask, you know, is that always desirable? Should you always, is it always good to pretest? The answer is no. Uh, so it turns out that um, there are uh, several scenarios where it's actually undesirable to pretest. For example, if there's some uh, expected sensitization effects from pretesting, like if uh, because because pretesting is sort of typically similar to the post test, is similar to whatever you're measuring uh, after the experiment, um, that might 
reveal to the participants what it is exactly you're measuring and studying, and this might cause them to change their behavior during the experiment. Um, and so sort of bias your measurements in, in, in any way uh, because you're sensitizing them to the test itself. Okay, so that's a one, one example where it's actually undesirable to, to pretest. Um, another example, you know, maybe it's just physically impossible. Maybe you're studying, uh, I don't know, like infants or something, and uh, I don't know, cognitive development in infants uh, over a period of years. You can't really pretest them on their babies because you know they won't be very cooperative. I can attest to that. Uh, personally. Um, okay, or for example, if you can assume that the thing you're um, interested in is constant, like if, if you're studying, I don't know, death, right? Um, you can assume that everybody participating in your study is alive at the time they start the experiment, because otherwise you wouldn't recruit them. So, you know, if that's a constant, it doesn't make sense to pretest for them being alive because uh, you're sort of alive by construction. So anyway, so the book talks about more examples of um, scenarios where it's undesirable actually to pretest. Uh, but okay, let's say, let's say you do want to pretest for the reasons we mentioned. So here's sort of possible ways of doing this. Um, here in the, in the left-hand side, um, you have um, a variant of the basic design with both pretest and post test. Okay. Um, on, uh, but you still have only one group being treated and the other one not being treated. Uh, you could also have a variant of the middle design there where you have sort of competing treatments being administered to the different groups, but you pretest and post test uh, both of those. Or you know, so something in between or a variant of the third one that's possible too. So th this has some advantages. Um, we'll talk about that more in a, in a second when we talk about factorial designs. Um, so this is sort of, a, it's a good design, right? If, if there's little risk of um, participants becoming sensitized by the pretest and that biasing their behavior uh, somehow, if there's little risk of that, it's always worth pretesting whenever you can, especially if attrition is um, something you're worried about. Uh, okay, so here's here's this is a very common design. You'll see this a lot, uh, the factorial design. So, for example, you have I don't know two factors um, with two levels each. Uh, for example, um, let's say you're interested in studying. Um, the effectiveness of, of tutoring. So here you could have one factor be the amount of tutoring received, right? Do you receive, I don't know, one hour of tutoring versus six hours of tutoring? Okay, that could be one, one of the factors. The other factor could be who is administering the tutoring? Is it better, that could be a research question, to um, receive tutoring from um, the instructor or is it better to receive tutoring from the TA or something else? Okay, so you could, can imagine having this, say, two by two um, matrix with these two levels for each of these factors and um, wanting to study all of, all of these combinations, right? So, you know, instructor administered one hour tutoring, instructor administered six hour tutoring, TA administered one hour tutoring, TA administered six hour tutoring, okay, all combinations. Um, so this has a number of advantages, and that's why you will see factorial designs very often. So three, three major advantages. One, they typically require fewer participants. Okay. Why? Why, why do you think that is? What's your intuition? Why, why, do, why would you expect that to be the case, if at all? 
the intuition here is that everybody does double duty. Okay, so you can see here how every participant gets treated with both some version of the A treatment as well as some version of the B treatment. Okay, so everybody does double duty and you, um, you get more information out of them this way because, because of what would happen otherwise, right? Let's say you want to study all of these combinations. You could do that with a design similar to the top one or two, right? one of the basic designs you just think of these as you know completely independent treatments right so you would recruit some group of people to participate in the a1 b1 treatment and a completely different group of people to participate in the a1 b2 treatment and so on I guess I'm not really showing the fact that they're doing double duty in this in this diagram, though. So let me let me save that um, advantage for uh, for a minute later. So let me table that. I'll come back to this in a second. Um, okay. So that was one advantage. The other advantage is you could test combinations of treatments more easily, and importantly, you could test interactions between treatments. So this is actually worth spending a minute on. So here's what an interaction looks like. Yeah, and these are always very interesting to study. So for example, uh, here um, we are studying, we're comparing uh, novices versus experts. So two groups you see there on the, on the x-axis. You're comparing um, them using two different media to interact with the computer, either the mouse or a touch screen, okay? Um, and the outcome variable you're interested in here is the number of targets on the screen that they are able to select per minute, right? So which of these uh, human computer interaction uh, devices, media is more effective? So here's, how how the interaction might play out. So for example, you could see that the novice users can select targets faster with a touch screen than with a mouse. Okay, so, so that's represented there. On the other hand, experienced users turns out, like this is whatever you're measuring, right? This is the outcome of your, your measurement after the experiment. Experienced users can select targets faster with a mouse compared to a touch screen, okay? So where's the interaction? The interaction comes up here as you're sort of looking at how, how these things um, cross. So the, um, the target selection speed for both the mouse group and the touch screen group, okay? So both the blue line and the red line, um, increases with experience. Okay, so you could see that the slopes are positive in both of these, right? So when you go from novice to experienced, you are more productive, right? With either one of these. But at the same time, the increase in speed is greater for the mouse than it is for the touch screen. Does that make sense? So this is one example of how um, one of the variables here, um, experience, interacts with the um, um, device you're using. So this, these kind of interactions, remember we talked about, we, I used two terms um, 
last class, I was uh, trying to explain the difference between two commonly used terms that appear um, when talking about causal relationships. Do you remember what those were? Something that I said is often confusing. Mediator and a moderator. That's the one. Okay, so which one is this one? An example of? Moderator? Yes. So this is what a moderator would, uh, would look like. That makes sense because it, it, let's say there's some causal relationship between um, device and productivity, or number of targets selected per minute. Right, there's some causal relationship there as established through your experiment. Okay. But this relationship is moderated by experience. Okay. The strength of this relationship varies with experience. That's an example of moderation. Um, and in statistical terminology, this is called an interaction effect between these two variables. And um, that is something that this uh, factorial design allows you to capture because you sort of have um, all of these combinations uh, part of your, your study. And so it's one um, major advantage of this design and the reason why you will see this design often. Okay, so now let me go back. Um, right, so you, we, we could have, we'll see more of this in a different class. Uh, looking sort of at, at longitudinal time series analyses, you could also have multiple observations over time um, before you uh, administer this treatment and then multiple observations afterwards um, that gives you more data points to, um, to study if these effects of your treatment are robust and so on. They, uh, they last uh, longer and, and whatnot. So it's one design that allows you to, to study things over time. And finally, so this is the one that I um, so started talking about a little bit when I talked about factorial design. So this crossover design, um, this is actually um, um, one where um, I think you will see this um, benefit of participants doing double duty more. So here, here what you see is um, that there, um, so there's a pretest, right? And then participants being assigned to one of two treatments. And then a post test, it's all very normal until now. And that's followed by the opposite uh, treatment. Uh, so essentially another round of, of treatment and observation, right? Another treatment and another post test. Uh, and you see here how the same participant is doing double duty uh, in the sense that they each get two treatments, but right? everybody gets the two treatments. And moreover, you see that they're getting them in different order. Okay, so it's very useful if you expect that the order of treatments matters, right? So this certainly can matter a lot with. Um, with drugs and so on and, and medical research. But I'm sure there are examples where this matters with, with computer science research too. And the idea is that by um, crossing the participants and having them, um, so, so there's two advantages to this. One is that you can um, assess the effects of order, if any, with this design. And the other one is, that everybody does double duty. So um, you can effectively recruit fewer participants uh, to participate in your study overall uh, because you use the same participants multiple times. Okay. Um, Bakken? Yep. So I guess with these um, alternative tests that we have, that I guess, don't we lose information mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I guess we lose like the like what the basic XA XB versus C was trying to do, in that sense, um because now that we have like confounding variables, we can't. I mean, we can learn more by like their interactions, but then 
I guess we we lose the information about them and their singularity. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I think that's right. Um, the book actually has more examples of these and probably some of the ones you're mentioning with a pure untreated control in there as well. Uh, I've, so I think, selected um, a few that sort of fit on my screen here, and there's probably more that I didn't include. So I think you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to illustrate some of the points of variation between these um, and uh, not so much come up with the ideal design that sort of works best in any scenario. I don't, I don't think there is one. It's sort of dependent on, on you know, um, the specific context you're in and the kinds of threats to validity that you anticipate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th this is not exhaustive is the point. Mm -hmm. This list you see here on, on the screen. All right, so, uh, so here's another maybe slightly more digestible way to think about the same uh, idea, another way to look at designs. So this is again coming from the human computer interaction literature. Um, so let's say you're uh, at the study design phase. So first thing, like first decision, design decision that you're making is um, based on this question, like how many independent variables are you studying? Is it just one or is it multiple? Okay. If it's just one independent variable that you're interested in studying, then you um, go with a basic design if it's multiple, you're better off with a factorial design. Okay. Um, so then once you've decided this, um, based on how many variables you're studying, you're interested in, you uh, also look at how many values each of these independent variables gets. Okay, so that helps you to determine the number of conditions you need to recruit participants for. Um, okay. Um, and based on this, you either choose a between group design or a within group design. So I'll, I'll explain this in a second, but um, just remember these terms. These are very commonly encountered terms in the literature, between group design or within group design, okay? So like once you um, learn these, you, um, you can talk about any experiment uh, in these terms. So here's what between group design means. Between group design, also known as between subject design. Um, here, every participant is only exposed to one experimental condition. Okay. Um, so for example, if uh, the task is to type a 500 word document and you're studying how effective different keyboard styles are. Um, let's say you've identified three styles of keyboards that are of interest to you in the study, the typical QWERTY keyword, the Dwora key keyword, and an alphabetic keyword. Okay. Uh, then you um, recruit uh, three groups of participants and participants in each group are exposed to only one of these uh, conditions. Okay, this is called a between group design because you're comparing between these groups. Uh, there's only one treatment per group, okay? If you go back to this other diagram that I had a minute ago, um, you will see that most of what was there on the screen was uh, probably a between group design. Okay, so it's a very common design. The other one, the within group design, is where you uh, expose the participants, the same participants, to multiple conditions, to multiple treatments. Okay, this is called within group design or, or within subject design. Okay, so this is the main the main distinction between experiment designs. Is, is it a between group design or within group design, or between subjects within subjects? Okay, so if you remember this one thing, you've uh, sort of remembered most of what there is about designing experiments. Uh, so he, in, in the keyboard example here, um, every participant uh, 
would have to say type in three documents instead of one, right? And they would have to type in each of the three documents using uh, a different keyboard, one of these three keyboards that you're studying. Does that make sense? So here's sort of how they, they stack up against each other, how they compare the, the, two, um, the two designs. So um, let's look at the between group design. So one major advantage of the between group design, <clears throat> remember this is the one where you recruit different groups of participants, only one treatment per participant. A major advantage there is that it avoids learning effects. Okay. So if you remember from a couple of slides ago, uh, from those other diagrams, um, I had an example where uh, I administered two treatments to the same subjects. Okay, So learning effects can occur if in between the first treatment and the second treatment, people have just gotten better at the task, right, for reasons that have nothing to do with the treatment itself for example just more practice right maybe they've just um in the formal methods teaching formal methods uh, example from uh, last time you know maybe they've just learned how to design software better they've had more practice and um and the nl2 code example from uh from before you know maybe they've just sort of learned how to implement those tasks better they, they've warmed up right have just become more comfortable with the kinds of tasks that uh, you're, you're asking them to do. And whatever improvements you're observing potentially have nothing to do with the treatment, the second treatment you're administering, just with the fact that they have learned to be better at the task. Okay, so that's a major advantage of the between group design because you only have one treatment per group. That makes sense? Okay. Um, another advantage of that is that it uh, has lower risk of um, some of these confounding factors that have to do with participants um, getting tired of the uh, of the study, and um, you uh, and 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 that impacts their uh, performance uh, in the study. So it could be that people become less productive at typing or whatever it is you're doing. Let's say we're doing the keyboard typing example from before. They type slower, right, um, over time, or they type slower with the second uh, treatment just because they've gotten tired. They've, they've already typed I don't know, hundreds of words in the first um, condition and they're already tired and bored and whatnot. And they can't get, uh, can't wait to get out of this. So it could be that they're just fatigued, right? It's not that their performance has dropped because the keyboard is different, but it could be that their performance has dropped because they're fatigued or, you know, some combination of the two, but you can't really separate those. That's the, the thing. Um, and that's not an issue at all with these between group designs, because again, every participant is only exposed to one intervention, one treatment. Okay, so that's another sort of advantage of that. Now, the it's it's there's no free lunch, right? Remember, I told you, uh, like running theme of uh, this class and research methods in general is there's no free lunch, and uh, they're all flawed and um, imperfect in some way. So for example, here, um, you, uh, with a between group design, you don't get this uh, benefit of people doing double duty, uh, right? So you would need to have different groups of people in each condition. So that probably means that you need to recruit a larger set of participants for your experiment than you would otherwise with a within group design. So why, why is that? So that's because, because um, there is, um, so now because the, uh, by construction, right? By construction, these are, 
independent groups of people. Every uh, participant only receives one treatment. So uh, th there is no uh, participant shared in, in common between groups. Okay, so that means that there's possibly more noise due to individual differences between participants. That makes sense. So uh, let me let me try differently. If I have a within group design, and I have the same participant being administered two treatments, right? Except for you know fatigue and learning effects and these things that um, that I uh, just discussed. Except for those other individual level characteristics that might make a difference, right? Are constant between these two treatments. It's the same person, right? You know how much experience you have with programming in general or with how well, your level of education or you know other things that might matter right those are constant between these two treatments right they do not change because it's the same person whereas here that's not the case it's it's never the same participant receiving multiple treatments so there's higher risk that um there will be noise in your in your data right due to um or you know variation in in the outcomes you're measuring due to individual differences rather than to the treatments themselves so how do you deal with this in general you deal with this by increasing the size of your sample right we talked about that earlier right so this idea of random assignment works or, or experiments work because of this idea of random assignment, as long as the samples are, are large enough. The samples are large enough, all of these individual level differences that might confound the analysis um, or just average out between the groups, right? But if you have smaller samples, there's higher risk of these individual level differences making more of an impact. Does that make sense? So this is a huge advantage of within group designs and a huge limitation of between group designs, right? You just need more participants. You need more participants because, you know, you, you otherwise you won't know if um, there is no effect, say, because of your treatment was ineffective or because you just didn't have enough participants to observe those effects of the treatment because other things, uh, other individual level uh, characteristics or differences um, drown out the main effect, right? Does that make sense? Does that make any sense? So that's so what you see uh, there on the right hand side as an advantage of these within group designs that um, you can more effectively isolate these individual level differences, and therefore you can um, carry out studies, experiments with smaller samples. Uh, you can recruit fewer participants uh, and still have sort of comparable uh, statistical power to detect these effects. Um, and we talked about learning effects and fatigue as so two disadvantages. We talked about that already. This is just a summary. Okay. Um, okay. So let's look at a few um, a few things that could go wrong. Uh, a few more things. We've seen some already. A few more things that could go wrong. So when you're um, doing experiments, actually, when you're doing pretty much any kind of uh, study, empirical study, you are typically thinking of uh, four types of validity. Statistical conclusion validity has to do with uh, the validity of the inferences you're making about that correlation between treatment and outcome. Internal validity has to do with um, the inferences you're making about the causal nature of that relationship. Uh, construct validity has to do with the measurement itself, 
like the, the inferences you're making about um, the validity of the things you're actually measuring relative to the theoretical higher order constructs that you're trying to capture. Remember, we had an example, I don't know, a few lectures ago of um, using last year's income as a measure of uh, wealth and how that is limited in, in, in some scenarios. Right, so that's sort of an issue that uh, affects that particular construct. The, the construct of last year's income, that's the variable you're measuring, um, is not a good representation for the variable, um, last year's income is not a good representation of this higher order construct of wealth. That has to do with construct validity. And we've seen examples of this before. We talked about that uh, in, in previous classes. And external validity has to do with like, generalizing, to, to taking the inferences you're, you've made in, in that particular scenario and sample and whatnot, and applying those elsewhere and, and generalizing those. Okay, so these are roughly the four types of validity. Uh, and there's entire chapters in the book describing all uh, kinds of things that could go wrong with each and every one of these. Uh, this is from the Shade Ish Cook and Campbell book. I've pasted all the chapters in the, in the drive folder and I encourage you to look at those. Um, I, I won't go over these now because it will, it will take too long and in a way it's, um, yeah, it's just, it'd be impossible to do that now. So I'll, I'll let you read about all of this on your own. There's a few things I want to talk about now though. Let me skip about some of this stuff. Uh, oh yeah, so interesting piece of trivia. So something, uh, so here, here are some of the threats to internal validity. You might find these interesting. Um, one in particular is so-called regression to the mean effects. Has anybody, has anybody turned this, has anybody heard this term before? Regression to the mean? Sort of a very common threat to internal validity. So remember, internal validity is about um, the, um, uh, uh, the causal nature of the relationship you're, uh, you're studying. Okay, so here's, uh, so here's what, that, uh, what that would look like, um, regression to the mean. So it's a very cute example. Um, so regression to the mean happens when um, there are successive measurements on some given variable, okay? Uh, and the um, artifact here is that extreme observations tend to be followed by more central ones, okay? So in other words, if you see something that's really uh, out of the ordinary, it's more likely that you will see something more common the next time you look. Okay, you can't just keep seeing these extraordinary things for too long. Okay. So the classical example, this goes back to the 1800s. Classical example of this is um, height in children. So uh, the children of extremely tall men tend to not be as tall as their father is the observation. Okay, so this is sort of a um, classical, classical example of regression to the mean. Okay. So do, do you see how that makes sense? So yes, they are, um, children of very tall people are on average tall, but, um, if the father is really, really, really tall, you know, becomes unlikely that the children will also be just as tall because, um, because say height in humans is normally distributed. And there's only so very few people that are, that are just that tall, right? So it becomes um, unlikely. So this is called regression to the mean because as you're sort of observing um, height over generations in this case. So this is the successive measurements. As you're observing this variable, uh, once you've seen some very extreme values, you tend to see much more uh, central ones after that. So now coming back to our experiment, uh, 
um, like if if say you select participants in your study based on uh, I don't know um, their performance on some pretest or their grade and empirical methods or something like this, right? If, if say you uh, select people based on their grade in empirical methods and you want to have the absolute top performers in empirical methods participate in your experiment. So you only select people with A, which is very, very, very rare, right? It's like almost never happens that somebody gets an A in empirical methods, okay? If, if that's the case, right? You know, chances are um, when you measure them later on, um, these people won't score as highly, right? So chance, uh, chances are it was a fluke that they, they scored so highly in, in empirical methods in the first place. And you know, when you test them again on other things, they won't do as well. By the way, with athletes, this is a very common observation also. You see that there are people that so have an exceptional season batting or whatever, um, they tend to do less well the season after that. Okay, so that's an exa another example of regression to the mean. It's very common in sports. Um, okay, so this was one piece of trivia and, and many others. Please read the book, it's very interesting. Um, okay, so we have about 10 minutes. So let me show you a few more things. Um, a few more hopefully interesting things. Okay, yeah, so here's one. So let's talk about hypothesis tests for, for a minute. So let's say you're, uh, this is the idea that you, know, you want to um, draw some conclusions uh, about that um, causal relationship you're studying in your experiment and you've collected, collected some data some, on these uh, outcome measures. Um, and you know, there's always a chance, right, that the treatment group just got better, did better, uh, whatever, um, by chance, as opposed to because they were treated, right? So you want to um, establish how likely that is, right? So could random chance be responsible for whatever observed effect uh, you're observing? Is, is sort of the, the question you're asking yourselves, right? Let's say um, people complete tasks faster when they're using uh, Frank's NL2 code uh, plugin versus when they're writing code from scratch, right? Let's say you've observed that after the experiment, but you want to uh, establish that uh, it's unlikely that they, uh, they did that just by chance. Right? So how likely is it that they were more effective at their tasks simply by chance, not because of the tool itself? Okay, so this is where hypothesis testing comes in. So there's typically a null hypothesis um, that is always of the nature that chance is to blame for the observed effect. For example, one could be in, in this case that there's no difference in the mean time to complete a task uh, when using NL2 code versus when writing code from scratch, right? That would be the null hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis uh, is the, the counterpoint to that. It's as whatever you hope to prove. Um, for example, that it takes less time on average to complete a task using NL2 code uh, compared to writing code from scratch. Okay. So um, you. Um, we played with this before. We played with this last lecture. Like, why do you even need a hypothesis? Why not just look at the outcome of the experiment and just go with whatever treatment does better? Uh, many reasons why this is a bad idea. Um, one has to do with the fact that um, you're, you know, only only observing a small sample of, of participants typically, and you want to have more confidence that this is a more general effect. Another reason why this is a bad idea, why you actually need to have some hypothesis has to do with um, just human nature. And I've asked you this uh, uh, last time, I've asked you to generate a random sequence of coin flips. Uh, and uh, it turns out that it's very easy to uh, identify which of these sequences have been generated by humans 
versus which are truly random sequences because humans have a tendency to underestimate randomness. So they, I guess the, the point is people just cannot be trusted. To, uh, people either see patterns in, in data where there aren't any uh, or um, so they fail to uh, they fail to underestimate uh, randomness. Uh, and in the example of the coin flips, you, know, you uh, saw that the sequences of consecutive uh, heads or tails in, in the coin flips you generated tend to be shorter uh, on average than the sequences of consecutive heads or tails that are truly random. Okay, so I've, I've shown you this with this particular experiment. I've uh, used my computer and a pseudo random number generated generator to generate similar sequences as the ones you have written. And then I've compared their, uh, the median length of sequences of consecutive ones uh, in, in these two groups. And um, the human uh, set, the one that you all wrote, has a median length of four consecutive ones the truly random one generated by the computer has a median length of five. So it's very easy to tell them apart. Uh, you're, you're bad at uh, estimating randomness, as am I, it's just human nature. Okay, but this was, this was an aside. Um, this other one, though, is important. So how do you, let's talk about p-values for a little bit. I'm sure you've um, seen this term uh, a lot, if not used this term uh, a lot already yourselves. So for example, coming back to the two hypotheses, we have this null hypothesis that there's no difference in the mean time to complete tasks. Uh, and the alternative hypothesis that it takes less time on average to complete the task using the NL2 code tool. Okay, so now let's say you've ran some statistical test uh, on, I don't know, uh, uh, these measurements of task completion times and you obtain some p-value from that particular statistical test. The particular test doesn't really matter here. This is a more general uh, observation about p-values in general. Uh, so I, I won't care about the test uh, at all, uh, in specific test at all. But let's say you did this, okay? How do you interpret this p-value? What does that p-value mean? Open question, there's no expected answer. What does the p-value tell you about the... Um, the nature of this relationship or how do you, how do you interpret that? Um, I think usually the p-value is the um, probability that the um, our observation um, is uh, follow following the null hypothesis. So the probability that we get the observation that we are seeing from the assumption of the null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Not really. It's a, it's about the the probability that we see such an observation. Who thinks otherwise? Thanks, Sam. What other opinions do we have about p values? Do you, do you all agree with Sam or does anybody disagree with Sam and, and why? I'm gonna pick on Bobo just because I see him there in the corner. Yeah, I think it's, it's more about that um, if I do the experiment, let's say 100 times, there will be a certain amount of time that the, the, 
um, how, how should I phrase this? Um, Hmm. So let me rephrase. What I'd like to know as a researcher typically is um, how likely is it that um, the um, difference in mean time to com task completion is just due to chance? How likely is it that it's due to chance? That's something I would like to know as a, as a researcher, right? So, you know, can I, the question to you is, can I interpret the p-value uh, as um, a measure of that? Like if I have a 5% p-value, sort of this common magical threshold in the, in the sciences, can I interpret that to be the likelihood of um, just chance explaining my, my effect? My intuition is that you can, but I think there might be a trap there. Hmm. Bobo is skeptical, like very suspicious. He was a wrong person to, to pick on. How about CJ? What do you think? Well, uh, I know, like, so you, so usually when, like, before I, when I, when I, every time I, when I see a P value, I just treat it as, um, uh, how confidence, how, how confident I can trust the, the result. So that's, that's my intuition here. So that's more, I guess, uh, more in line with what I'm asking, uh, is if, if I can interpret it in that way. Um, like how much can I trust that this is due to chance? Like what's the likelihood that the effect is due to chance versus not? What, what about you, Ben? Um, yeah, I, I think I, like, I think my, my understanding of p-values is, yeah, it's kind of the likelihood that, um, the observed result was just, you know, due to random chance rather than the intervention or whatever your hypothesis is. Mm -hmm. Right, so, and actually this is very common. Most people believe this. Um, turns out Sam was right though about this one. So um, most of us are wrong when we, uh, when we assume that um, Sam was right. So what we would like, ideally, what we would like the p-value to convey is um, the, the probability that the result is due to chance. That's what we would like it to, do, to, to convey because you know, if that value is low, we can conclude that we've proved something, right? So basically we would like the p-value to represent the probability of the null hypothesis being true given the data that I'm testing it on. That's what we would like. That's not what we are getting though. So this is a very, 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 very common source of confusion. Like everybody's confused about this. So there's no reason to uh, feel bad about any of this. I, ho I hope you don't. Um, what the p-value actually represents is not that at all. It's quite the opposite. And, and Sam had it, had it right here. It's the probability that given a, a model of, of chance, the results that you have um, or results as extreme or as the ones you, you have could have occurred given that model of chance. So it's literally the opposite of this. It's the probability of observing the data that you have in front of you, given that the null hypothesis is true. Like how likely is it that values as extreme as the ones you have observed could have occurred given that the null hypothesis is true? It's exactly the opposite. Okay. And this is a subtle but very important difference. So um, I guess I guess I won't keep you. We, we you can read about this in the slide deck and in the book. And um, I'll just end with this. If so, if you have space for one thing uh, in your buffer from today's lecture, 
right? Let it be this one thing about p-values. So let me jump to the conclusion. There's a cool uh, example here. You could walk through that on your own. Uh, let this be this one thing, right? There's this very common false belief that the probability of a conclusion being in error can be calculated from the data in a single experiment without reference to any external evidence or the plausibility of the underlying mechanism. That's sort of the key, key idea here. So that comes in to, to this thing here. Right? The probability of the null hypothesis being true given the data we have, okay, needs also these additional ingredients okay and the p value from any any statistical test gives you this probability of observing that data like given that the null hypothesis is true okay so you can use the base theorem to to convert between these but the point is they're not the same so you need these additional components. So, you know, please, please read about this. This is really, really important. Like if you remember only one thing from like today, uh, you know, let this be the one thing. And if you have space for two things in your buffer, the other thing worth remembering is this distinction between, um, between group designs and within group designs. And when it comes to experiments, kind of, you know, what that means and what their relative strengths and weaknesses are. That's also a sort of very important, very common thing that comes up a lot. Okay, so yeah, two, two things to keep in mind from today. And we, um, ah, yes. Um, so we'll talk about regression modeling next time we meet. Uh, so we're gonna look at some like hands-on stuff. Uh, I'm gonna be showing examples in R uh, just because that's the language I'm familiar with. If uh, I don't expect you to learn R if you don't want to, but I encourage you to learn R. It's very powerful. So you know, if you if you feel like uh, brushing up on on your R skills, then by all means, please do that. Also, please look at the readings. Uh, uh, there's a lot more detail there, and in the slides, I'll post the slides uh, today. And um, I guess finally, the one other thing I wanted to ask you is, since we're sort of at the midpoint in the semester. Um, I guess it's a useful opportunity to reflect on, on how much or little you're enjoying the class so far. So I want you to think and tell me, you know, offline or however you want to tell me uh, in class, you know, however you're comfortable, uh, tell me what you'd like to see more of and, and less of in the second half of the semester. For example, Hannah has already indicated that she wants to get more homework. So she's asked that I assign more homework to everyone. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll take that into consideration for the second half of the semester. But, it, it, you know, if, for example, if you'd like more depth on some things, less depth on other things, you know, whatever, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to accommodate these. Uh, just let me know what you would like to, uh, to see more of and less of in the second half uh, through any channel you feel comfortable. All right. So that's it. I'll see you next week. Thanks.